Ephesians chapter 1 in your Bible with me, if you would. Uh, Let's look at verse number 3, beginning at verse number 3, Ephesians 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings uh, in heavenly places in Christ. Now, if you're in the habit of underlining in your Bible, you might want to underline the words there, in Christ. Verse number 4, according as he hath chosen us in him, God hath chosen us in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And right away someone says, Pastor Marty, there is unconditional election. God chose us before the foundation of the world. Do you see that? Look at your Bible. Do you see that? God chose us before the foundation of the world. Wait a minute. I have misread the verse. I want every eye back on the verse. According as he hath chosen us in him. In him. There is a tremendous difference between being simply chosen and being chosen in him. Underline, if you will, in your Bible in verse number 5 where it says, By Jesus Christ. You could look down to verse number 6 and underline the words, in the beloved. Verse number 7, in whom, speaking of Jesus, we have redemption through his blood. Verse number 10, that all things in Christ. Verse number 10 again, in him, the last two words of the verse. Verse number 11, in whom. This is not an example of what the Calvinist theory says is unconditional election. But rather, throughout this entire passage, there is a condition based upon our relationship with God, and that is that we be in Christ. Notice also in verse number 4, according as he hath chosen us in him, in Christ, that is the condition, that is the condition. We are chosen based upon being in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should all go to heaven. Is that what the Bible says? Now look at the verse, verse number four. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, what? That we Christians, those who have trusted Christ as Savior, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. The condition of salvation, salvation is not unconditional. The condition of salvation is that I be in Christ. If I am not in Christ, I am not saved. Pastor, how do you get in Christ? I'm so glad you've asked that question. Look at verse number 12. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Those of us who are elect and chosen to be conformed to his image, to be predestined to be placed as sons, not just as angels or some kind of strangers or foreigners in heaven, but related directly to God as sons. Those of us who are in Christ have that predestined glory that we will have trust, not only have trusted him, but ultimately he will see us through to the end. Verse 13, how does that happen? In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, The gospel of your salvation, in whom also that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The second you in our reading, in our study today, is going to be the you of unconditional election. The second part of TULIP, pardon me, is unconditional election. The idea that there are some who are chosen from eternity past to be saved, and then by default that there are others who are chosen to be reprobate or to be damned. Now this doctrine is a logical extension of what we spoke of last night, so I need to connect the dot for you. According to the Calvinist theory, everyone is dead spiritually, and that is correct. However, the definition of dead spiritually does not fit the scriptural definition. Their definition does not. Remember, we said that one who is spiritually dead can still respond to God, Adam and Eve being examples of that. The rich man in Luke chapter 16, another example of that. There is still a response mechanism and a consciousness there because God has given an individual free will. But according to the Calvinist theory, everyone is dead. So, and dead meaning no response. This is a confusion of physical death with spiritual death. Now, audience, just for the sake of illustration, let us just consider that every person in this room comprises the entire world. This is the entire world today, every person in this room. And that all of you now, according to the Calvinist theory, all of you are dead and cannot 
cannot respond to the gospel. Could everybody just like kind of slump your head and look dead for a second? Okay, a few of you were able to do it. Some of you are really good at that. Okay, look this way again. Everyone is dead according to the Calvinist view and cannot respond to the gospel. So if you are all dead and I stand here and preach the gospel, you're not responding to it, you're not embracing it, you're just dead, you're just dead. There's no response whatsoever according to that theory. But Pastor Marty, how can that be? Why, we would get into an unbroken cycle if you're just preaching but we're all dead. That sounds like it would be useless. Uh Aha! So the second part of the theory then comes into play. Since you're all dead and can't respond, God must do something to intervene in your deadness to bring you to life before you can believe the gospel. Now remember, I mentioned that briefly yesterday, this idea that you're born again before you're saved. We quoted some Calvinistic teachers as saying this happens at infancy where a child is regenerated and made alive. So pretend everybody in this room, all of a sudden, you are all dead and I need to do something. Pretend that I am God for a brief moment in reverence, just pretend. And I need to do something to cause you to hear, to understand, and to embrace the gospel. So here is what I do. I hand pick certain individuals. Now, most of you, I don't know you. So I don't know any merits or demerits, good or bad. I really don't know you. So I'm going to pick you. So I, now, I, I'm just humanly speaking, I like the, uh, the necktie there, the patriotic necktie. I like that patriotic necktie. So I think I'm going to pick him. Okay? Stand up. You're now alive. Congratulations. Okay. And uh, let's see. That's a nice tie, the gold tie. You stand up. You're going to be alive. We've got two guys going to heaven. We need some girls. This is a bad... Right here. Right here on the front. You stand up. Then, oh, look at that necktie. That bright red. You stand up right there. Yeah, yeah, that tie. Black shirt. Good combination. That's very striking. My wife always says contrast is important. And she gets on me about those things. Now, I've got several over here that are select and chosen. You just stay select for a minute. I need to get some from over here. It wouldn't seem fair. The white coat... You stand up, let's see, uh, you're from India, is that right? India, every tribe and nation, you stand up please, okay. (laughs) Okay, I need a Hispanic over here, do I have a Hispanic? Is there any Hispanic over here? Give me one Hispanic, there, okay, right there, stand up, stand up. Son, don't be shy, just stand up, I'm I'm trying not to be racial here, okay, stand up. (laughs) Okay, everyone else is dead I'm preaching the gospel, no one else can possibly respond because all the rest of you are dead. Those of you who are standing, watch this, you have been made alive and I have selected you not only to be made alive but to respond to the gospel and to go to heaven. You are the chosen few. Let me ask you a question, audience. Where does the rest of you, where do you end up? Just say it. Hell. Okay. These are the chosen few because they are the only ones that I have chosen to make alive. Listen carefully now. Because they are the only ones that I have chosen to make alive and the rest of you I have left reprobate. Is there any possibility that you dead ones can somehow come alive again? No. So all of my preaching of the gospel to you is not good news but it is bad News. Say it with me. Not good news, but bad news. Because only these have been selected, only these have been chosen. All right, you may be seated. You say, Pastor Monty, does the Bible teach any such thing? No. The condition of salvation is that we come to Christ as our Savior by personal faith, by personal trust in Him. And we see that in verse number 13. Now take your Bible and turn over to Romans 8. Romans 8 quickly, and then I'll try to cover this. Dr. Mullinex, what time would you like this service to end? The clocks aren't working. In about five minutes, he said. (laughs) Between 2.20 and 2.30. Okay, very good. That'll be plenty of time. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, familiar verse. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now notice this in verse number 25. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to go to heaven when they die. Is that what your Bible says? 
Now look at it again. Look at the details. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate what? To be conformed to the image of his Son. This is not speaking about sinners being predestined to salvation. It is speaking of saints being predestined to conformity to the image of Jesus Christ. And all of this is based on something that Paul calls foreknowledge and that Peter represented and also called foreknowledge based on what God knows before. In other words, God who is omniscient knows the heart of every individual before he is born. He understands and knows all of your responses. God before we're ever born knows whether we will hear the gospel, receive the gospel, and trust Christ. He knows all who would be saved. He knows all who will reject Jesus Christ. And his predestination, not here speaking of salvation, but his election and predestination is always based upon foreknowledge, what God knows. And since God knows all who will receive Christ as their Savior, he says all of them are, according to verse number 29, predestined to be conformed to the image of his dear Son. Here is the problem. While we believe firmly in the sovereignty of God, we do not believe that God has decreed everything that takes place in this world. There is a huge difference between sovereignty by decree, where everything that happens is planned by God and decreed by him to happen, and the concept of sovereignty of control, where God allows men to outwork their evil will oftentimes and their free will, and yet maintains full control over his universe. The Calvinist theory is this, that every detail of life, of everything that happens, was pre-programmed. Similar to how you would program a computer, but this is the entire universe. You say, oh, Pastor Shirley, no one would believe that. Well, let me quote Palmer, who is a committed Calvinist. He says this, quote, all things, now, now young people listen, hear the gravity and the enormity of this statement, if you don't hear anything else. Committed Calvinist Palmer says, quote, All things that happen in the world at any time and in all history, whether in, in inorganic matter, vegetation, animals, man, or angels, both the good and the evil ones, all things come to pass because God ordained them. Everything. This is the Calvinist theory of decree sovereignty. I continue the quote. He says, All things come to pass because God ordained them, even sin. The fall of the devil from heaven, the fall of Adam, and every evil thought, word, and deed in all of history, including the worst sin of all, Judas' betrayal of Christ, is included in the decree of our holy God. Do you have a problem with that? You should. You should. To believe that God is the one who decreed the Holocaust and the death of millions of Jews and their torture at the hands of maniacal leadership, to believe that God has decreed every abortion that takes place and the silent scream of every baby in the womb, to believe that God has decreed the specific actions of moral perversion and murder and rape and all of the corruption in this world, to believe that that happens as a decree of God is to sully God's hands with the filthiness of sin. You know, years ago as a preacher, you'd sometimes hear people make the excuse for their sin. They would say something like, oh, Pastor Mahdi, you know, the devil made me do it. The Calvinist theory says, the Lord made me do it. Now, my Bible tells me in the book of James that God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. If indeed all of the sin of this world is simply something decreed by God, 
If my personal sin is inescapable because the actions of my personal sin are decreed by God, if it is a foregone conclusion that I will do wrong, that your neighbor, neighbor will do wrong, that your roommate will do wrong, if every detail of human existence is a foregone conclusion and nothing can ever change, then ladies and gentlemen, this whole world is nothing more than a sadistic game. And all of a sudden, God becomes a heavenly computer programmer who has a very bad side. You say, Pastor, you're being very plain. I am. I believe that the theories of Calvinism blaspheme the holiness of God. May I say, when I sin, I am responsible for that sin. By the way, that's the first step toward getting it right, is to admit it. And God did not pre-program me to commit specific acts of sin. Oh, no. But my will is sinful and corrupted and tainted. Now, thank God for the presence of the Holy Spirit. Thank God I have been born again. But that sinful flesh, Paul said, in me and my flesh dwelleth no good thing. How many know that's true of themselves? Absolutely. But I take responsibility for my sins. I don't blame God. But listen to what our Calvinist friend writes. He says, quote, If sin is outside the decree of God, that he did not determine sin specifically, if sin is outside of the decree of God, then the vast percentage of human action is removed from God's plan. That's odd. But this is his declaration. God's power, he says, is reduced to the forces of nature. Sin is not only foreknown by God... It is also foreordained by God. In fact, because God foreordained it, he foreknew it. Isn't that interesting? In the Calvinist theory, God can only foreknow something because he foreordains it. I'll say more about that in just a moment. He says, in fact, because God foreordained it, he foreknew it. Calvin is very clear on this point, says Palmer, quote, man wills with an evil will what God wills with a good will. Young people, do you see the enormity of such a position? That God not only has programmed the good things in the world, but he has also programmed the bad, and he has programmed everything that happens. So that nothing that happens takes place out of this pre-programmed decree. This is something that is known as fatalism, and it is at the very heart of the Calvinistic theory. It also matches very well with the Islamic theory of fatalism that says essentially the same thing. Now let me bring it down to where you live. The last time I spoke here, I was um, considerably heavier than I am right now. I think about 35 pounds. My doctor threatened me with death if I did not get rid of some weight. Now, it would have been the easiest thing in the world for me 35 pounds ago to say, to make this statement. (laughs) Well, I was foreordained and decreed from before the foundation of the world to be fat. If you take that position, it's very unlikely you will do anything about it. Is everyone following my thinking? But when I decided and understood that it was my free will and my freewheeling fork that was the problem, (laughs) when I came to recognize that the free will was too free with the fast food, and I, and I understood that I was willingly filling my mouth full of all of the good things White Castle has to offer, And by the way, for you Southerners, that's crystal, okay? Crystal hamburgers, the same thing. About the same thing. White castles are better, but let's not go into it. (laughs) When I came to that conclusion that I could do something about it and needed to for my health, then I did. I took responsibility understanding the scripture that says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, which strengtheneth me. So Calvinism teaches a determinism or decree. The biblical view is this, that God is in control. His sovereignty is a sovereign control. And God's will in this world is never violated. And man bears personal responsibility all at the same time. You say, Pastor Marty, that's hard to understand. Well, think of it this way. Some years ago, I was in a convention, a meeting somewhere, and I had the opportunity to stay after the meeting at a very large uh, and prominent church. If I named the church, many of you in this auditorium would be familiar with it. And the pastor of the church was ill at the time, so they asked a seminary professor who was an adherent to the Calvinistic theory, they asked this particular professor to come and to preach a message. I'll never forget, he opened the Bible and talked about Herod's slaughter of the innocents. 
Remember when Herod the Great decided to kill all of the children because he was trying to eliminate the potential Jewish Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this Calvinistic professor stood before the audience and talked about this horrendous act of Herod the Great. And then he said this. He said, God foreordained from before the foundation of the world. Now I am paraphrasing, of course. God foreordained that Herod would commit this precise act. He said, God foreordained that these little children, these toddlers, these infant children, would be picked up by the hands of Roman soldiers and would be dashed against brick walls with their blood and their physical bodies falling to the ground in front of their crying mothers. He said, God in heaven designed and enacted every single act of wickedness and carnage in the thousands that were eliminated when Herod undertook this great extermination. He said, God ordained every bit of that. And I was shocked. And I thought all of a sudden, here is our gracious and loving and kind and merciful and holy God whose hands are now stained with the blood of these thousands of innocent children. And I thought, how will this astute seminary professor move us through this? And he said this, he said, I can prove that it's so from the Bible. And he took us to Jeremiah 31, where the Bible predicts this to happen. And he said, you see, because God predicted it, that means he must have pre-programmed it. May I say something, young people? My God is larger than a computer programmer. It is not necessary for him to program sinful actions in order to know that they will take place. Is everybody following me on this? In other words, God is far greater than one who has to simply program something and predict based on program. No, our God who knows the end from the beginning understood the wickedness of human hearts. He saw the decisions that would be made for Herod's decision to slaughter the innocent. It is all on him. And yet God's will in this universe is not thwarted in the slightest degree because the wrath of man is worked to praise him. Say, Pastor Mahdi, what does this have to do with the matter of salvation? In the matter of salvation, for the Calvinist theory to work, only those who have been brought back from the dead before they believe can embrace the gospel. Only those few young people that I had standing here by way of illustration, only they can embrace the gospel because they are the only ones that I have chosen to make alive. Well, you say, Pastor Monty, if, if it is really man hearing the gospel and the Holy Spirit wooing and drawing him, but ultimately man coming to the place of surrender and belief in Christ, if that really is the case, isn't that man saving himself? I mean, after all, if you claim that men can respond to the gospel under the wooing and convicting influence of the Spirit of God, isn't that man having a part in his salvation? Well, famous Bible teacher R.C. Sproul made this remark. And R.C. Sproul subscribes to the Calvinist theory. He said, the term election refers specifically to one aspect of divine predestination. God's choosing of certain individuals to be saved by making election conditional upon something that man does. Now listen carefully. Even if what he does is simply repent and believe the gospel, he says God's grace is seriously compromised. In other words, if I preach to you that you need to repent and believe the gospel, you need to turn to Christ for your salvation, if I preach that to you and I expect you're able to do so under the wooing of the Spirit of God, if I do that, then I have compromised the grace of God, the gospel. Take your Bible quickly, turn to Romans chapter 4. Is there some kind of works to be confused with faith? Can this type of thing really compromise the grace of God when I say that it is by belief? Paul did not think so. Romans 4, verse number 2. The Bible says, For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture, verse number 3, Romans 4, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now I want you to notice in the next verses, there is a dichotomy drawn between faith and works. Faith and works are not the same according to the scripture. Verse number four. Now to him that worketh is the reward, let's say salvation as in this case, is the reward or salvation not reckoned of grace but of debt. If I require you to work and you work, you have earned your way to heaven. But we know no one can earn his way to heaven. But look at verse number five. But to him that worketh not, 
but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Young person, don't buy this silly idea that if we claim you must believe to be saved, you are somehow adding works to salvation and contributing to your own salvation. Your salvation is bought and paid for by the precious blood of Jesus Christ who shed his blood on Calvary's cross and gave his life for our sins as a sacrifice. But the condition is you must believe. And belief is not a work. It is interesting to note... um, I have a few moments. I'm going to share this with you. I received this book on Monday. Can our camera people give us a nice close-up of this book? Oh, can you get it closer than that? Can you zoom right in? Yeah, come on. There we go. Closer, a little closer. A little closer. No closer? Okay. Do you see the title of the book? Just read the title of the book. The Joy of Calvinism. By the way, look at the picture of Calvin. Looks like he had something bad to eat. Doesn't look, like, doesn't look like joy to me. This theory, I read this book on Tuesday. This theory that only certain select are saved and the rest are damned is something that this author is forced to deal with because he holds to the Calvinistic theory. I want you to listen to his statement. He says this, What we know about the love of God and the cross of Christ compels us to say that God's saving love cannot, in fact, be extended to everybody. If we try to have everything, we end up having nothing. God's saving love cannot be extended to everybody. Calvinism limits God. The God of the Calvinist theory is a very small God who, according to the theory, is placed in positions of limitation continually for the sake of ongoing support of the theory. This writer continues on page 67, none of this makes the idea of God passing over the lost and allowing them to remain in their sins any less horrible to us. He admits this idea is horrible to us. But then he says, Calvinist theology shows us, by the way, not the Bible. Calvinist theology shows us that this horrible truth must be accepted. That does not make it any less horrible. And I thought the gospel was supposed to be good news. Well, you say, Pastor Monty, it is good news to those who are saved. But according to Matthew chapter 7, broad is the way which leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. Narrow is the way that leadeth to life, and few there be that find it. If truly there are fewer that will be saved, who will come to trust Christ as Savior, then that will be lost. And the majority of them is lost. If my message is the message of Calvin that the majority who are lost are condemned before the foundation of the world and have absolutely no hope and are born in this world completely bereft of any hope of salvation whatsoever, if that is my message, then how is it good news? Contradiction to that, it could not be good news. It would only be a message of condemnation to the millions and millions and millions whom God created unable to respond to the gospel message, whom God knowingly invites to come to Christ, but knowingly says they cannot, and whom God created for no greater purpose than for them to be the burning chaff of the flames of an eternal hell. That is no good news gospel. What does the Bible teach? Salvation is available to all. We've quoted several times today, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But what about the next verse? For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The Calvinist theory would tell us that God is naive and doesn't fully understand that, well, while he used the word world, it really doesn't mean the word world. It means only the world of the elect because obviously God knows that it's only the elect for whom Christ died because he only chose a certain number and so God is giving us a generality but is naive. No. Look at the verse. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world 
but that the world through him might be saved. John 1.29 claims that Christ came for the sins of the whole world. 1 John 2.2 2 declares that Christ is the propitiation or satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. Nowhere does the Bible declare that God doesn't love and de- desire the salvation of all sinners Nowhere. First Timothy 2 verses 4 through 6. God will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. There is one God and one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. In 167 verses of our Bible we find the word whosoever mentioned 183 times. And whosoever always means whosoever It means anyone. It means whosoever will. You say, Pastor Mahdi, what is the condition for salvation? The condition for salvation is belief. John 1 verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Acts 16 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. John 6, verse 40, this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone that seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. John 5, 24, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Galatians 3, verse 22, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Belief is the condition of salvation. I want to kind of finish out with another quotation that should shock those of us who know what the Bible says. This man, Edwin Palmer, is an apologist for the Calvinistic theory. And I'm going to quote him again. He said this, Although sin and unbelief, this is a quotation now, although sin and unbelief are contrary to what God commands, God has included them in his sovereign decree. He has ordained them and caused them to certainly come to pass. And then he makes this statement. How is it that a holy God who hates sin not only passively permits sin, but also certainly and efficaciously decrees that sin shall be? How is it? How is it, he asks. I would say it isn't. But how is it that this God who is holy and hates sin not only passively permits sin, but also certainly and efficaciously decrees that sin shall be? And Mr. Palmer declares, Our infinite God presents us with some astounding truths. And to that I would say hogwash. My God is not the author of sin. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. This view of sovereignty makes life no more than a game. Some months ago, a man in my church came to me and handed me a book. He said, Preacher, I'm confused about this book. It was a book, I think the title something like, Myths That Christians Believe. And he showed me, I think it was chapter 9, if I remember correctly, of the book. And here was the myth that Christians believe. And this author, this uh, professing Christian author, was writing against these myths. Here was the myth, chapter 9. Prayer changes things. And according to the book, that is a myth. May I ask you a simple question, and this is not a trick question. How many of you believe that prayer changes things? Do you believe that? Good, that's wonderful, because you're correct. Hezekiah most certainly believed that when the prophet Isaiah said, you're going to die, and then uh, Isaiah hardly got out of the room, out of the building, when all of a sudden Hezekiah started to pray, and the Lord granted him 15 more years. I would say prayer changes things. In fact, the Bible teaches us that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Well, you say, Pastor Marty, how can a, a supposed Christian author write such a chapter that prayer really doesn't avail of anything? It doesn't change anything. Because he was logically fulfilling the progression, which is a logical progression, of the Calvinistic theory. And the entire chapter said that since God has ordained everything that happens, the good, the bad, the happy, the sad, the pleasurable, and the painful... Because God has ordained everything that happens from eternity past. Prayer doesn't change anything. It has already been pre-programmed. And he went page after page after page to supposedly prove that there is no purpose in prayer. 
And when I came to the end of this chapter reading it, I thought, well, surely why would anyone pray? I mean, if everything is already predetermined, prayer becomes kind of a waste of time. And at the end of the chapter, he said, but we should still pray, quote, because we want to. Well, I don't know about you, but the spirit indeed is willing sometimes, but the flesh is weak. But I should pray because prayer channels me to an omnipotent God who can change situations because he is in sovereign control. He didn't decree everything that happens. He has control. Now, everyone look this way. You say, Pastor, I've slept through the whole thing. Okay. One illustration. And I want this to stick with you. Pastor, how can you illustrate God's sovereign control and the idea of man's choice? Listen carefully. I want you to picture something in your mind, and this is an imperfect illustration, but it will serve as an illustration. Picture it this way. How many of you play chess? How many of you play chess? Okay, we've got a lot of chess players in the crowd. How many of you play checkers? Okay, we've got a lot of dummies in the crowd, too. Um, <laughs> now, let's tell the difference between chess and checker people, but um, we'll, that's another sermon. Pretend, if you will, that you are playing chess with God. Now, I'm illustrating what life is, how this works, how this sort of works. It will be imperfect, but follow me. You are playing chess with God. You have all of your pieces lined up on your side. God has all of his pieces lined up on his side. You take the first move, and so you take your hand, and you pick up your pawn, and you move your pawn to spaces. Hey, Pastor Monty, come on, playing chess with God. Why, we, it, we know who's going to lose. Well, just, just for sake of argument, you move your pawn two spaces. Now notice, God did not reach over and put his hand on your hand and move the pawn for you. He did not do that. You moved your pawn two spaces. Then God moves his piece however many spaces. And throughout the whole game, there's, there's this movement of pieces. God never forces your hand, but it's an odd thing. You keep losing pieces. And in fact, this chess game is over very, very quickly with God as the winner. You say, well, Pastor, of course God is the winner because God knows everything that will happen. Follow me, please. God knows every move you will make without forcing you to make that move. You have free will. You have with free will human responsibility. But as I make the moves, good and bad, God who knows all of those. By the way, do you know God is so big? He not only knows the moves that I will make, but he knows every move I could possibly make. Do you know God is so big that he not only knows every move that I will make and every move that I could possibly make, but God knows the ramifications of every single move that could possibly be made on that board ad infinitum. He knows it all. And guess what? At the end of the day, try as I might to thwart the plan of God, or try as I might just to win the game, God himself is the winner. Hear and understand something. Without controlling my every sinful move and action, without decreeing those things, there is a God in heaven who always wins in the end. And he may use us to be part of his will as willing vessels in his hands. Paul talks about that. Or he may use an individual who has hardened his will, an unwilling vessel, to be part of his ultimate plan. Listen, without decreeing the sinful actions of that individual. Because God is much larger than a computer programmer. He is the God who controls all. And nothing can thwart his plan, and there is no blood or sin on his hands. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, beyond human comprehension, but a God of love who sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world.